Wonderful to stand in front of you this morning and to welcome such a lovely congregation of people into the building. It's always a delight to be able to say hello and good morning and welcome. I don't just welcome the folk that are sat amongst us, though that's lovely, but I know that there are folk joining us out there through Facebook and through Zoom, and so you're delightfully welcome. Eh? We don't just come into the presence of each other when we assemble. Glory to his precious name, we come into the presence of the living Lord Jesus. So that's who we welcome you to, and that is who welcomes you. Glory to his name. Hey, one or two little announcements before we begin, before I hand over. Hey, my name's Simon, I'm, I'm the church secretary here, but later on, Peter hey, will be preaching the, from, from the word, from, from Habakkuk. So if there's anything that affects you this morning, if, the, if you feel the Lord Jesus speaking to you, then feel free to get in touch with myself if you want, or, or Peter, or anybody else in the fellowship. And the Lord does speak. The challenge is on us to respond. And sometimes it's easier to respond whenever you're responding with somebody else. So I leave that invitation open. Other bits and pieces, uh, the Baptist Assembly, we are a Baptist church in Leamington Spa for anybody joining us from far away in the middle of England, uh, but the Baptist uh, Union or Baptists Together have an assembly which happens later this month, the 13th to the 16th of May. So that's an online affair this year, but anybody is welcome to, to join that. All I would say is if you're hoping to, to join that assembly uh, online, let me know please. It'd just be interesting to know who has had an opportunity to go along to that and whether uh, there's anything from that that is right to bring back to the fellowship. So, so that's all I would ask on that. Apart from that, it's the practicalities. Please remember, I see face masks on, as I would expect. Thank you very much. The normal social distancing, uh, the, what is normal for us at the moment, hopefully for not too long, applies. A, uh, and as I've said before, a, those of you who are out in the internet are delightfully welcome to sing at home, but those of you who are in the building, we will be led in worship by, by our band. A. And finally, I know joining us remotely are, are a, a Mr. and Mrs. Edwards. So I wanted to make it my job to... To, on behalf of you, welcome a Mr. and Mrs. Edwards to, to our fellowship this morning. But also, on behalf of Mike and Jean, who spoke to me uh, earlier on today, just to extend their gratitude to all of you for all of the little things that happened to make yesterday so wonderful for them. They, they know, well, they're, they're convinced that they couldn't have had the day that they had had it not been for you. So, so thank you for that on their behalf. I'm going to hand over to Malcolm, who's leading our time together this morning, and then later on Peter's going to preach. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? And the technicians are waving it. No, that's okay. Good. Always the best thing to start with. Can anybody hear you? So, welcome. Um, I'm Malcolm Hayes. For those of you who haven't seen me on uh, in this church before and uh, my job is to lead the service today. Peter will be preaching the sermon. He'll be glad to hear it's not to me. So, um, but that's my job is to lead the service. Not, hopefully I haven't done this as my service. It's not my service. This is a service of praise and worship to God. But I'm just the person who leads it, that's all. Uh, those of you in the building will see that you've got little cards on your seats. Um, these were hygienically put out, I point out, because my dear lady wife was wearing a mask and gloves when she put them out, so they're guaranteed they're not contaminated in any way. And for those of you at home on Zoom and Facebook, you might want to find a piece of paper and a pen for later in the service. It will become obvious why later. So let's have a pause for reflection. We've all come here from quite busy lives. Um, 
we've all had to do things in perhaps in a bit of a rush this morning as we couldn't find our masks or in my case I couldn't find my mobile phone or you can't find the zoom link whatever we come here in a bit of a rush or maybe we've come here feeling angry or worried upset fearful grieving possibly although some of us have come here feeling good and happy and that's wonderful just remember the words of Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter 11 verse 28 come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest so let's pause and in silence lay our burdens and cares down at the foot of the cross that's why it's here and let's be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let's just, just sit here in silence for a moment. So, what are we here for? We're here to give praise to God. We have a saying that says, give praise where praise is due. And in human terms, we know how to give praise to other people when they do a job well or when they have a good deed. But God has done so much more than that. It is why he deserves our praise. I quote from one, uh, the first letter of Peter, chapter one and verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's something worth praising about. So now we come to our opening songs, and I'm going to have to move from here to there in a moment, because I'm also the bass player. The first is on the theme of praise. It's let everything that has breath praise the Lord. As we said, we're here to praise God, and this song says we should give praise at all times. Morning, evening, when we're grieving, which is a hard thing to have to do, when we're laughing, when it's very easy. Because as it says, if we could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to praise. And the second is an invitation as we come into the house of God. It's to worship Jesus, God's only Son. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him, worship Christ the Lord. And it's time, as the song says, to forget about ourselves and concentrate on him. Excuse me while I move and attempt to strangle myself with my best guitar. Everything that, everything that has been praised. 
So let's have a pause again. We've sung, concentrate on him and worship him, so we need to do that now. Let's be open to the Spirit of God and ask that his Spirit will truly move in this place. Let's pause. So we now come to our time of prayer. Firstly, I'm going to offer prayers of praise, and then Iris is going to come and offer prayers of intercession for other people. And this is when you're going to need your piece of paper and your pen. So just have it ready. 
What I'm going to do is say something that we can give God praise for. And after each one, I'd like you to respond with, Lord, we praise you. So I'll say peace. You respond with, Lord, we praise you. So let us pray. For your great love in sending us your only Son, Lord, we praise you. For your Holy Spirit that brings us comfort, Lord, we praise you. For this place to worship, Lord, we praise you. For the freedom to worship you, Lord, we praise you. For your word, the Bible, that teaches us, inspires us, and corrects us, Lord, we praise you. For creation, in all its complexity and beauty, Lord, we praise you. For the privilege of coming to you in prayer, Lord, we praise you. For giving each one of us life and for the promise that if we believe in Jesus, we shall have eternal life to come, Lord, we praise you. On the piece of paper that you've been given or you found at home, write down one thing you want to praise God for. Take it home with you. Put it somewhere where you can see it. Look at it during the coming week and remind yourself of what we have to praise God for. Iris will now come and lead our prayers of intercession. in his letter to the Philippians, writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Let us come to God with our prayers of intercession. We offer prayers for our world, our nation, and our community. Father God, we especially at this time remember the people of India. Whilst we give thanks that restrictions here are gradually easing, we remember the people of India where the coronavirus continues to spread at a terrifying rate, putting severe strain on medical systems and resources. We ask, Father, that governments across the world will continue to work together to provide equipment and vaccines to help to get the virus under control. We remember too the people of Israel mourning not only the death of 45 people at last week's religious festival, but also the number of suffering significant injuries. We pray, Father, that they may feel your healing and comforting presence in the days and months ahead. Father, we know that you are a listening God. We are so grateful that the easing of COVID restrictions here in the UK continues. We give thanks that the vaccine rollout progresses on schedule 
and we are especially grateful that restrictions concerning care homes will ease further in the coming days. This will provide so much comfort, not only to the residents, but to their families and loved ones also. Thank you, Father. We remember as well victims of domestic abuse. It's all too easy for us to think that our fellowship is untouched by this. But this is abuse that often goes unseen to outside eyes. We pray for any who are suffering at this time that they may have the strength and courage to break free. Within our own community, Father, we remember Jean and Mike who were married yesterday. Whilst numbers in church were limited, thanks to the wonders of technology, many more of us were able to witness such a joyful occasion. It was just wonderful to see them looking so happy. We pray for a long and happy life for them together. Sadly, there are several people known to us suffering from cancer at this time. We remember Kathy, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Janet, with blood cancer, and Martin, with liver cancer. May they feel your loving and healing presence, Father. Within our fellowship, we remember the following in our prayers. Vivian and Lorna. Steve and Christine. Karen and Al. Gracious Father, you alone understand their concerns and anxieties at this time. We pray they will feel your reassuring hand on their shoulders. Finally, Father, we continue to give thanks for the work of Peter and all our deacons. Much of this work is unsung and unnoticed, but you see everything, Father God. Continue to uphold them in their service to you. Now, in the silence that follows, we bring before you our individual prayers. Let us close by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We come now to another song. This next one is Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. The instructions on the music for this says how to sing it. It says, gently and prayerfully. 
So that's what we need to do. We need to sing it as a prayer. We need to mean what we sing, not just things that come off here, go out through your brain and straight out through your mouth. And I'd say that to me because I can do that quite easily. So think about what you're singing. Make it a prayer, your own personal prayer. I was particularly drawn to the line, take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. That's what we're about as Christians. That's what it should be. That's what we need to sing and we need to sing and mean what we sing. This morning's reading is taken from Habakkuk, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. 
Habakkuk chapter 2. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations, and collects as his own all peoples. Amen. Thank you very much, Joe. So we continue in the book of Habakkuk a book with, which is essentially one big cry to God, How long, O Lord? We are in 7th century BC Judah. Habakkuk is complaining uh, to God about the injustice that is in the land, and God has now told him that he will judge his people by letting the Babylonian Empire conquer them. And we, we picked up, as Joe said, right at the start of chapter 2. And this is the heart of the book of Habakkuk. This is the text that changed the world. But before we dig into that, let's pray. Lord, when we stand watch and he, to hear you speak, Lord, we do not expect dry words from the pages of an old book. We expect your living word, living, active, the word which will not return to you empty, but accomplish in our lives the purpose for which you have sent it. So, Father, we pray, will you speak to us? Will you anoint our ears so we can hear what you are saying? Anoint my mouth that I may faithfully unpack the message that you have for us this morning, that we may praise your great name. Be glorified in this place, we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is the text that changed the world. So Habakkuk is in this dispute with God as far as he is concerned. God has abandoned his people, abandoned them to their injustice and their sin. And so the, the picture that we start with there in chapter 2 is the prophet waiting on the ramparts of the city, awaiting God's approach back to his people. Perhaps he is expecting God to come and deliver him a stinging rebuke for uh, his, you know, his words to God, his reproach to the Almighty. But the answer he gets from God here is not a rebuke, but a promise. And it starts with uh, essentially the Hebrew equivalent of triple underlining and highlighting in fluorescent yellow. Oops. God responds saying, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. So what he is about to get is, is a vision, it's a revelation, that is, it is a new light on the person, the character, and the plan of God. And Habakkuk is told to make it plain on tablets. 
And the way it is put in the Hebrew is clearly an allusion to the tablets of the covenant given to Moses in Exodus 24 and so on. In other words, this revelation has a force comparable to the Ten Commandments. And it is, it is much more than just an answer to Habakkuk's question. This revelation is meant to be proclaimed. When God says, you know, write it down on tablets so that he, may read, he who reads it may run with it. Why would you run with a revelation on the bunch of tablets? Well, because you are a herald and you proclaim what you have heard to sort of all corners of the nation. It continues, for still the vision awaits it is its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. What follows will unfold in God's own timing, and it concerns last things, God's great plan of salvation. It hastens to the end. Moreover, appearances, when you look around you, will contradict it. It will not always look like the promise will be fulfilled. That is why the Lord adds explicitly, and it will not lie. It may not look like this to you right now, Habakkuk, but the vision will not lie. Let's pause right here just for a moment, because I know that some of us are in that kind of place right now. God had promised you something. You heard it clearly. Maybe you stepped out and took a risk. And now you find yourself in a place that you did not expect and you're left wondering what happened to the promise that you so clearly heard. And you are starting to doubt. You wonder whether you heard it quite right. And in your darkest days, perhaps you are wondering whether God is quite as faithful to you as you thought He was. And then perhaps you feel guilty for entertaining such doubt. Let me tell you, he is faithful. And I've been in that kind of place a few times. I was there six years ago in a job I didn't want, wondering what had gone wrong with my life and my ministry that I no longer was in. And like many, I was there at times last year when every plan seemed to go out of the window including the plans that the thought God had. And if that resonates with you, I'd like to say two things. The first one, God is absolutely faithful to every single promise He made. Wait for Him. He is. Second thing I want to say is, please, if that is you, ask someone to pray with you. And my phone number is 0742132719 if you would like me to pray with you. Let's continue. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. All will happen in God's time, not ours. Now, after all this sort of triple on the lining and repeating, you know, what you're about to hear is key. Bright yellow highlighter pen in this introduction. We come now to what God wishes to reveal, not just to Habakkuk, but to all of us. And he continues, behold, the sort of his soul, the enemy's soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The text that changed the world. Here is a verse so rich, so important, that it takes three whole New Testament books to explain it. And I will not be able to do it any sort of justice this morning. The letter to the Hebrews devotes an entire chapter to it, chapter 11. 
The Apostle Paul builds his theology on it and cites the first twice. First, in his letter to the Galatians, Galatians 3.11. Secondly, right at the start of his, his big, beautiful letter to the church in Rome. Romans 1.17 reads, For in the gospel of Jesus, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that, righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And then he sort of spans, spends 16 chapters unpacking all of that. And in 1519 AD, an obscure monk in the Augustinian order called Martin Luther read these 2,000-year-old words as if for the very first time. You see, Luther had tried so hard to lead a holy life. You know, he entered into holy orders in monastery, and he was doing all the confessions and penances and following all the rules that the Roman Catholic faith offered him, and yet he still was this tortured soul. He had no assurance. Or he looked at himself, he looked at the mirror, and all, this, all the good deeds that he did were, were to him seemed like filthy rags. He did not understand because he understood himself too deeply. He did not understand why on earth, how on earth, God, a holy God, could accept a man like himself. And then he read, perhaps for the hundredth time, but for the first time he truly read, the righteous will live by faith. And later on, he wrote, he wrote, I started then to understand the righteousness of God. I discovered that I was born again and had now entered through the open gates into paradise itself. When these words, the righteous will live by faith, found Martin Luther, his agonizing was over. He understood, finally understood, that faith is the key to life, that faith is also, also the key to, to uh, the relationship we have with God. Not the good deeds that we do in and of themselves, not how often we confess our sins to the priest, not how much penance we do, not how often we say Mass, not how often we go to church, not how many religious rituals we observe, or how good we are at observing them, but faith alone. Faith creates in us a righteousness that comes from the grace of God and not from us. And Luther's realization soon ignited the 16th century Reformation, and so it's very much part of our own Baptist history as well. This verse of Habakkuk changed the world. And of course, it is not really Habakkuk's verse, it was inspired by the Spirit of God, God's own truth revealed in, us, in it, changing the world. Can I ask, has this verse changed you? Hold that thought for a moment. It's important to understand this word righteousness right. Righteousness does not simply mean being a good person. The word, the word tzaddik that Habakkuk uses here is a covenant term. Covenant is simply sort of the relationship between you and God and between God and us. So the righteous person, the, the, the tzaddik, is someone who lives within the law and covenant of Moses for Habakkuk. Likewise, for Paul, over 600 years later, a righteous person, a tzaddik, is someone who lives within the new covenant of Jesus' blood. It's a person who has this right relationship with God. And we do not become God's righteous people when we are good enough. That's not at all how it works. It's exactly the other way around. We become God's people by faith, and then He will walk with us, and we will walk with Him, and by His Spirit, He will empower us to become new and righteous people. 
Do you see that? And we so often turn that around. We so often try to make ourselves good enough so that, you know, we can, we can be good enough for God. Well, let me tell you, that's a fool's errand. It's the other way around. We come to him, and then he gets to work on us and in us. So let me ask again, has this verse changed you? I've met so many Christians in churches, maybe that's you right here this morning in this church, who feel a bit of a fraud, who secretly think that everybody else has their following Jesus act all together, but they don't, so in their hearts of hearts, they do not feel quite good enough to call themselves a Christian. Let me tell you a secret. If ever you entertain such doubts, and the secret is this, you aren't. But the good news is, none of us is good enough. We all have failed and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. And when the followers of Jesus first understood this, they, they asked him, "Then who, who then can be saved? We looked at that just a few weeks ago. Do you remember Jesus' answer? Because it's a really important answer. Any volunteers? Exactly. Thank you, June. What is impossible with people is possible with God. With God, all things are possible. That's why God in Jesus came to get us, to atone for us on the cross you know, I myself make a complete hash of this Christianity lark almost every single day. We all do. So we stumble and fall, and by God's grace, He picks us up again and dusts us off and lets us have another go because we can just trust by faith that He will get us there in the end. So if you stumble, if ever you feel like, I'm, I'm just messing this, this following Jesus thing up, be encouraged. The righteous will live by what? By faith. He will get us there. This is the verse that changes lives. The righteous will live by faith. Did Habakkuk understand all that about Luther and the Protestant Reformation? Of course not. He understood these words entirely in terms of his own times. But more than 600 years later, the Holy Spirit moved the Apostle Paul to quote these words, to argue that, you know, this gospel of Jesus Christ thing was not a novelty. It had been prefigured in the Old Testament. You know, read Habakkuk, guys. And 1,500 years after that, Martin Luther finally found rest for his soul when he grasped the depth of their meaning. The righteousness will live. The righteous will live and will live by his faith. God had told Habakkuk to write down these words for the fullness of time, and now the time had come. Yet, of course, for Habakkuk, that little phrase comes almost as an aside as God pronounces judgment on the wickedness of the Babylonians. Because the Babylonians are greedy and arrogant and bloodthirsty and ruthless because they kill without remorse and because they give themselves over to every sort of evil, God promises one day to call them too to account. But at that point, that day is a long way off for the prophet Habakkuk. Because Babylon wouldn't be brought down for another 70 years. They still have a lot of looting left to do, the Babylonians. They will plunder many nations. Their strength will appear invincible. Their end is determined, but it won't happen for a long time. What do you do? Put yourself in Habakkuk's shoes for a moment and his people. What do you do when you are sitting down 
and you're confronted with the might of the Babylonian Empire destroying the temple where you worship, destroying Jerusalem, carrying off its people into exile, what do you do? The righteous shall live by faith. What do you do when you're sitting down? It has the picture on the overhead. When you're sitting down by the rivers of Babylon, weeping, singing the Lord's song in a strange land, the righteous shall still live by faith. What do you do when a frightening and lethal disease washes over the entire world and changes it beyond recognition? The righteous shall live by faith. What do you do when your church is no longer what it once was and you're wondering what will halt the decline? The righteous shall live by faith. What do you do when you feel hurt and rejected and maybe you feel just not good enough? The righteous shall live by faith. The only survivor of a shipwreck was washed up on a small uninhabited island and, and he prayed every day feverishly for God to rescue him. Every day he scanned the horizon for help, but, but no one, no ship appeared on the horizon. And, uh, and exhausted, he finally you know, managed to build himself a little hut out of driftwood to protect him from the elements and to store what few possessions uh, wash, had washed up on the beach. But one day, after scavenging for food, he arrived at his little hut to find the hut in flames, the smoke rolling up to the sky, and, and, and he, he despaired because the worst had happened. Everything was lost, and he was stunned and angry and grieving, and he cried out, how, God, how could you do this to me? And there was evening, and there was morning, and the next day, he was woken up by the sound of a ship that was approaching the island, and a lifeboat came out to pick him up. And a man asked him and said, Finally, how on earth did you know I, I, I was here? And the sailor said, We saw your smoke signal. Maybe some of us this morning feel like our hut, our hut is burning. And if that's you, please do get in touch for prayer. But even so, God is good. Who knows? You may feel that your heart is burning, but maybe it is just a smoke signal. The righteous shall live by faith. When all you see around is trouble, the righteous woman or man remembers that God is still on the throne, that His voice still created the universe, that Jesus is still Lord, and that His purposes are still for good and cannot be thwarted. God is for you and not against you. He is love and not hate. He is mercy as well as justice. He is salvation as well as vengeance. He is the Redeemer as well as the Judge. In Him we find life and a hope and a future and rest for our souls. Amen. When dark clouds break overhead, and sometimes they do, the righteous shall live by faith. So let God's name be praised in the lives of His people. Come darkness, come sunshine. To Him be all the glory. Amen. In a few moments, um, we will come to the table and share bread and wine as a token of our faith. But, but first we will sing. We come. We come before Him just as we are with all our flaws and foibles, with the things that maybe we're not proud of. Everything. Without anything that would make us worthy of God's grace. Except for our faith in the blood of Christ shed for us on the cross. Let's sing.
just as I am without one plea, but let thy blood wash it for me, and that thou bids me come to Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. Just as I am, poor wretched blind, sight riches healing of the mind, yet all I need in thee to find Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. Now to be thine, We are now going to share the Lord's Supper as one of the key ways that Jesus has given us to express and maintain our faith. And if you love the Lord Jesus, whether you're a member here or not, please feel free to share the bread and the wine with us. If you are not sure about any of this, Feel free to let it all pass you by. You are among friends. Just relax. Come to this table without one plea 
except that the Lord's blood was shed for me and shed for you and shed for the world. Come because you tried life in your own strength and discovered that we live only by faith. Come because you have met God's loving Christ and you would want to love him more. Come because he invites us, you and me, to share this meal. Before we share it, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. And Jesus himself commands us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And at times we do, and at times we fail to, don't we? So let's be quiet for a few moments and bring the last few days and weeks to mind and just lay it all before God, to whom we can come in faith with all the baggage that we carry, and then lay that baggage down. Just as I am. The Scriptures say that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, brothers, sisters, be at peace. We are a forgiven people. The righteous shall live by faith. Luke tells us in his gospel, and when the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide this among yourselves, because I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten. And he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul that seeks Him. Lord, we are so grateful for all that this bread and this wine represent. We are here before you and put our faith in you alone. Amen. We share this bread as an emblem of Christ's body broken on the cross.
And now we share the wine in faith, drinking the cup of grace under the new covenant. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. Lord, in the meal we just shared, we remembered all that you have done for us, and we thank you. We thank you for what you are doing still today. And we thank you, although we don't know what's coming, we thank you already for what you will do tomorrow. And we commit ourselves to your mercy and grace today and every day. Amen. Amen. We're now going to remind ourselves once again of the plea that we have in Jesus before the throne of God above. We finish with the final prayers. Just as we are, Lord, we come to you.
Help us to remember that we can never be good enough, but we don't have to be. Because your great love for us gave us Jesus to die in our place and justify us in your eyes. Take your truth, plant it deep in us. Shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of Christ might be seen today and in this coming week in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Help us to live this coming week and all of our lives in faith. We close with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.